The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome in. We are bringing you some extra content because here in this household, and uh, even with my guests, we have a bye week. So why not make some extra content and just have fun with it, man? Uh, I got Jay from Unfair Sports here with me. Jay, how you doing, man? Hey, Josh, I'm doing well, man. Thanks for having me as usual. Uh, no, I'm excited. Like you said, bye week and coming off the high of it. I'm still on cloud nine right now. So just, oh, yeah. just understand that. Yeah, and, and you got a different experience because you got to be at the game, which is, you know, I'm, I'm jealous. Uh, it's definitely a bucket list game. Um, but, yeah, for, for those watching, we're going to talk a little bit of Oklahoma football from this Red River rivalry specifically because uh, Jay and I were both Oklahoma fans. We love Oklahoma sports. And seeing this victory, this was a big one. Uh, and I think na- nationally you can see everyone talking about how big this, this win was for Oklahoma and what this sets up for really not just this team this year, but for this program, um, because we, we've we, everyone's been talking about it. Oklahoma's going to the SEC. They're going to have to have a big game to go into the SEC, you know, for, for understanding what that means. And, and your defense is going to have to be better and your defense is going to have to help win games. Uh, but, Jay, let's start off first, um, uh, you know, because like I said, you were at the game. Was this your first time at the game? It's my first time going to the game. I've been to the fair before, but I've never okay. actually been in the Cotton Bowl itself. So, yeah, this was my first experience in being a part of it, and I'm glad I picked this year because I knew that it was going to take a little time for Venables to really instill what he's trying to do. And I don't think people understand truly what that means. We're telling you, I'm telling you right now, this team is different. And everybody thinks their team is different, I'm telling you, this team is different. It was proven on the field this weekend. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and for those who don't understand, because I, I think I've given in in the past, and I don't think I'm going to give in anymore because mm-hmm. I finally had uh, about about what the greatest rivalry was. Uh, you know, I, I've been given in to that a lot. And, you know, especially when I think we had David Cohn on the show a little while back, and he's a mi- former Michigan player, and so I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. You know, you've been a part of that rivalry, like actually in it. But... When you when you get to these rivalry games and, and after you've you've lived through a, a game like this with as the the stature that it holds, uh, you know, it, it explain to everybody why this Oklahoma Texas rivalry is the best rivalry, not just for the game that's played on the field because I think that is that is definitely debatable, um, but for the experience that you have, like you said, the State Fair, it's always around the State Fair uh, and it's always down at the Cotton Bowl, a true neutral site. Because it's split down the middle at the 50-yard line. One side is crimson and one side is burnt orange. Uh, so, I mean, ex- explain to everybody, because you, you've, you've been there now. Explain to everybody why this really is the greatest rivalry with everything built around it. Yeah, see, I think the craziest thing about it is, and I've seen some players talk about it, uh, it was Desan McCullough. He did an interview not too long ago talking about uh, going to the game. And, you know, people told him before the seat, you know, when he first got here, I'm like, yeah, you know, it's at a neutral site, so we're all going to go to Dallas. Roughly 200 miles for both teams, right dead smack in the middle, and which is even more fascinating. They were able to <laughs> align it that way. Yeah. But they told them, they were like, you know, when you go in there, you're recognized. It's half and half. It's literally orange, and then it bleeds crimson, or it's crimson, and then it bleeds orange. And it's like you can see the actual line of demarcation, which is even more fascinating when you see it inside as well as from a distance. And so he gets there and he's like, okay, that's weird. It doesn't sound right. Plus you're bust through the fair to get to the cotton bowl. And so when he first started seeing that, he talked about his excitement and stuff. And, you know, even for myself walking through the fair itself, grabbing a corn dog uh, and a beer while standing outside at eight o'clock in the morning and college game days, not too far from you. And then eventually you, you know, figure out how to get into the Cotton Bowl because it's not very well organized because you get 90,000 people into a stadium while they're also at the fair. It's craziness. So you're co-mingling with Texas and, and Texas fans and Oklahoma fans. But when you walk in there and you see the line from wherever you're sitting, no matter where you're sitting, you can see that line. It's amazing. It, it will blow your mind the first time you see it, regardless of if you're sitting up high or up low. When you walk in and you look, you're like, dang, that's the line. And then you start to see little trickles of crimson inside the orange, and you see a little burnt orange trickled inside the crimson because people get tickets that they can. But when you truly see it and feel it, it's crazy. And so McCullough said the same thing. He was like, what 
jumped out to him was going through the tunnel because every both teams, there's only one tunnel. Both teams go through the same tunnel. You run out and it's cheers. And then you get to about 50 yard line and it's booze. And he's like, that was weird to walk <laughs> in there and feel cheer than boo. And then when Texas comes out, it's all boos and then it's loud cheers. And it's like, it it's a surreal environment. And so I totally get how David Cohn, someone who's been part of the big game between Ohio State and Michigan. I mean, Ohio State calls them the team up north and yeah. uh, they X out every M before games. Have and- you ever been to Columbus when they do that? I've never I've never been there for the Co- so, Columbus or the or um or even been up to the Big House, which that's on my bucket list. Yeah, yeah, the Big House definitely is. Uh, up up in Columbus, it's fun though because you know with all the X's all over everything, you going down. I lived in Columbus and I was sitting there like, why the heck are all these street signs like X'd out? Like, am I not supposed to go down the street? And then I realized, oh. It's rivalry it's week. Only the you know, M. It's, it only is, the M that's marked yeah, out. Yeah, it's it's the game going on. And I even was driving pot. It was like in that same that was the first year I was there and everything, whenever this happened. And uh and, and then I even see a big McDonald's sign where they had caution tape wrapped around the, the McDonald's sign in an X. <laughs> you know, just craziness goes on. And and it is fun. Uh and, and even over at the Iron Bowl, that's a lot of fun. Or you go to like a a neutral site like uh I think Georgia, Florida. They play it there in in uh, Atlanta, don't they? Yes, Georgia, yeah, yeah. Florida plays. No, no, Georgia, Florida plays in um, at the world's largest cocktail party is what they call it. Oh yeah, and it's like in it's in like somewhere in like Orlando. It's basically yeah, yeah, that's like right. in between Athens, Gainesville, and so yeah. yeah so, but but too. but it's it's not the it's not the same as splitting it dead even down the middle because there, I mean, you you have mixed mixed fans that are just kind of kind of yeah. be bleeding all over the place this is split down the middle uh and like you said just the environment of running in and hear boo and then cheer or vice versa and then just the state fair around it you can sit there and, and be eating a, a funnel cake as you're walking into the game you know just just all of the stuff going on around it uh yeah i, I that's why I've, i look at this rivalry and and i think i'm going to stop giving in because I don't think it gets any better than that. And then on top of that, the traditions yeah. outside of the, the ROTCs from each team running 200 miles, literally running with a game ball, 200 miles to Dallas. That that's amazing. That's that's some really fun stuff. And then getting them, you know, getting them involved with it, uh, just just so much fun stuff goes into this rivalry. And I think, I mean, it's it's the best rivalry in college football. And I, I don't think it's I, and, debatable anymore. And, it, and, it, and yeah, it arguably is. And I can totally see everybody's debate behind theirs. I think the one thing about OU Texas that's that helps it is being that neutral site and seeing that split. Like it's it, there's never a home field advantage for either teams. It's true neutral, true trying to figure out who's the better team. And so with like Ohio State, Michigan, it's always split because one team's at home, the other team's away. And so you get that home feel feel which is different and same thing with the iron bowl and so i think with their games i mean with florida georgia it's a split but the biggest thing to me between them is that there's always some sort of major implications between the game with ou texas and i think that you get that with michigan ohio state as well nowadays they they're both pretty dominant in the big 10 and so there's always some sort of implications in that game Occasionally, Auburn will upset Alabama, and then they'll have something crazy happen. But for the most part, OU Texas, with even though OU is pretty dominant overall in that in the last 23 years, especially since 2000, honestly, since World War II, Oklahoma has the higher, has the better win percentage and the most wins. But overall, it's really the the big thing that jumps out from that game is that is there's always something that somebody's ruining for the other team. Yeah, well, and, and then on top of that, too, with that split uh, and, and really no home field advantage is that, like, I heard you bring it up, I think, on your show, um, yeah. where, where yeah, Tawi Walker start, starting off in their own end zone with nothing but burnt orange surrounding him in a, a marching in band, band for, for Texas, Texas band right, right, yeah, behind right behind him. him. Yeah. That was that was something I was bringing up was like, man, I don't know if we're going to get out of here because we're in <laughs> the wrong end zone. Uh, and then the huge run to break free and, and open up the field now. And now it feels it feels a little quieter because you're hearing the other side cheering for you. And, you know, it feels a little more. And then you cross that 50-yard line, and, man, it feels like you're in the glory line. And Oklahoma, 100%, 6-for-6 six six in the red zone. Uh, and, and that says a lot 
uh, you know, and I think you know quite a quite a bit of that was down in the correct end zone too, uh, especially that game winning that game winning touchdown. That was something that we brought up uh, here on on this show was that man I just just that that total surrounding that the fact that that game winning touchdown was right there in the crimson touchdown or in, in the crimson end zone. Uh, and, yeah, and, and no. The, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, the game that just, winner right there. Oh. Yeah, no, no better place to have done it. I mean, you can't write things up better than that. Um, but you know, looking at, at this game, you and I were talking. You know, just overall, th- this defense is absolutely improved. There is no doubt. We talked about this. We brought this up. How the the open field tackling, the fact that you're able to get pressure in the backfield, uh, and. and there's a lot of people that are saying, yeah, but man, how can you sit there and talk about this defense as if they're so much better when they let up 500 yards? What do you have to say to people who, who want to bring that up? You know, they let up over 500 yards to Texas. Yeah, it always cracks me up whenever you're talking about, um, like, I think USC fans have really been been the ones that going after me because, you know, USC struggled the last few games. You know, they against Arizona and Colorado, two teams that, you know, they're both four and well, three, four and two and three and three. So, and they're out not unranked teams and, you know, oh, you gave up 500 yards to Texas, you know, you should be considered bad too. And it's like, no, I mean, Texas was a, is a top 12 offense in the country. They're really good. And a lot of their yards were between the twenties. And this is the one thing that I like to point out to everybody. What the difference with this game and what everybody else played, not only is it a rivalry game, and we know how rivalry games can be um, for anybody. There, there's always something nutty that can happen because some teams want it more than others, especially if there's a quote-unquote underdog in it. But what Oklahoma did in this game is they they were they were critical and and great in the clutch moments of the game, the most important moments. Oklahoma is one of the best red zone defenses in the country. We've given up one rushing touchdown, but zero in the red zone. We that that rush touchdown by Jonathan Brooks, that was the first rush touchdown OU's yeah. defense has given up all season. And that was like a 20 something, 30 yard scamper. Overall, when they got in that red zone, four straight downs at the one yard line, it's nullified. And as you mentioned, the play that Tywee Walker, the next play when Oklahoma the ball, I think that's not talked about enough because not only did Tywee find the whole cut and go with Oklahoma who struggled with running, they made holes and he took advantage of it. But outside of that, six for six in the red zone, Texas got in the red zone three times and got a field goal the entire game. That to me tells you the difference in this team compared to what their Alex Grinch counterpart was. They, they're they not giving up the points. They're the 11th ranked team in scoring defense this year. OU's never been that high with the old regime. They are their top 50 in yards. And so a lot of the yards that comes in these games are garbage yards. You know, the garbage time plays and garbage time drives where I said Oklahoma will give you something from 20 to 20, but once you hit the 20, you're not doing anything. That's critical. That, to me, shows you that there is a potential championship mentality out of this team because if you can keep every team you play out of the red zone while out of scoring while they're in the red zone, you're going to be impossible to beat because yeah. that's the money plays. And a lot of teams at certain points will have to go for touchdowns. They can't only get field goals and be successful against this Oklahoma team. And so if you're holding teams to that, you're legit. And that's yeah. kind of to me why I tell people, yeah, Texas gave, we have a 500 yards to Texas. They're the only team that's gotten it so far. And Texas and, and, and any, a lot of the other teams defensively have given up more. And yeah. our schedule has not been just cupcakes. We've gone against some of the top offenses in the country, too, in some capacity. Yeah, yeah. And, and looking at it, too, that's where I always say stats only tell a, a, an outline of the story. They don't really tell the whole story. Because you, you look at those stats, and, yeah, it seems like that. But, uh, you know, like you said, within the red zone, how, how great that defense was and, and where, where they're allowed to give – or, you know, where they're going to allow you to take yards – um, but overall, there's just a lockdown, and then you you, you don't it, you obviously don't watch the game if you're seeing the the stats and saying, well, your defense sucks because you didn't watch them get up there on the one yard line first and goal. It's not just first and goal from the nine yard line, and they couldn't punch it in from the one yard line, and you couldn't punch Four it points. in on first, you couldn't punch <laughs> it in on second, you couldn't punch it on the third. You threw the ball on fourth down and were half an inch short still. That just shows you how bend, how bend but don't break this defense is going to be. Uh, yeah, and I, I agree with you, man. I, I, I see so much different about this defense. And I think 
that's that's where I think there's there's a lot of room for improvement because like you said, some of these big chunk plays that are that are being given up, they know that they see that. Uh, Brent Venables talked about it. I think after yesterday's practice, we, we we looked at this and we you know the way that these guys got an ear chewing was as if and even how they're acting is this as if they watched the tape and they lost the game, and that's exactly yeah. how you want to feel after after a victory to feel like you lost the game. Go in and fix it after still having a win on the on the win column. That's exactly how you want it to, to go. Um, but looking looking at at Dylan Gabriel, we got to bring him up because. Absolutely, the star of the game. Uh, n- never has there has there been a, a player to make a, 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 an impact the way that he has, uh, at least within this game here uh, this year. Because just looking at Dylan Gabriel uh, and, and everything that he did, he threw for sixty percent. Some drop passes in there, uh, some some passes that were to, to, uh, to get you know just to basically evade, uh, avoid bad decisions, uh, and then you you look at, at what he did efficiency i mean he didn't turn the ball over once not not a single turnover when he could have uh with the pressure that he was under only only one sack and that was really more like a qb run so i don't really know why the stat that that gets put on the stat sheet um but then 285 yards a passing touchdown 14 carries for 113 yards and then another touchdown on the ground the dude was phenomenal and then he was also the field general in a, a game-winning drive that, if again, if you didn't watch the game, you don't understand. A minute 17 left on the clock, you look up with zero timeouts, and Dylan Gabriel marches him down there. And, and it, it really was him. I mean, you got to give credit to, to the to the wideouts. They were getting open. Uh, and then just the overall awareness by everybody. You saw it. There, there wasn't any kind of uh, Chase Claypool celebration after you get a first down. No, it was set the ball down, run back to the line, get set, let's run again. Uh, and so, I mean, just looking at Dylan Gabriel – Personally, I feel like I'm not going to put him at the top, but I'm going to put him up there ranked tied with the top maybe three guys. I would say Caleb Williams, Bo Nix, uh, and, and and Michael Penix Jr., those other three guys. I'd, I'd say he's tied right there at the top of the Heisman, Heisman race right now, wouldn't you say? Yeah, no, I'd put him in the Heisman conversation. I believe he is at least top five. You know, I, would, I wouldn't discount the way that uh, Jaden Daniels is playing down there at LSU with, unfortunately, those two losses. It's going to basically disqualify him from winning the Heisman. Because, um, you know, those regular season losses always hurt you. And then Shadur Sanders over there at Colorado, who's put up the most uh, – you know, the most passing yards, over 2,000 passing yards this season, like 18 touchdowns, two picks. But he's also the most sacked quarterback in college football right now by a wide margin. And so Dylan is definitely deserving to be up there. He's been very efficient and good. And the funny thing about it, this is actually one of his worst passing games this season. Uh, 23 for 38. That's, you know, not too far, over, about 57, 58%. That is not the Dylan Gabriel we're used to. He came into this game in 74, 75% completion percentage. And so traditionally he's hitting on deep passes and short passes. But in this game, it was so much more going on, especially the fact that OU run game hasn't been up to OU run game standards. They're still trying to figure it out. We came into the season with our top two running backs starting off in injury with Gavin Sawchuk as well as Javante Barnes. You saw Barnes a lot last season. He had toe surgery in the offseason, and so he's still trying to you know get back from that. Coach uh, Venables had mentioned in one of his pressers that it's not healing, like it's not responding to treatment like they like. So. We're waiting to get him back going. And Salchuk had a hammy issue going into fall camp. And so now he's just trying to get himself back into 100% status as well as playing shape. So, you know, it takes time to do that, especially those soft tissue injuries. We all know they linger. We're kind of doing the running back by committee to try to get everybody going. And Dylan recognized that, okay, if we're going to win this game, I got to make sure. I keep the defense honest. And so you started seeing him scramble 14 carries, 113 yards and a tutty. That 44 yard scamper he had was amazing. It was one of those, the, the Texas defense thought they were going to collapse the O-line. He scooted up, saw that nobody was paying attention and he just bolted. He made the right choice. And if he was just a little bit faster, that was a touchdown. But yeah. the good thing is, is that he recognized where to go. He got the yards and, at the same time, you know, the, the 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 hope is we could have turned that into points. Unfortunately, we got a missed field goal out of that one. But if you if you take 
some of those missed opportunities and you execute on it, man, this could have been a lot bigger game, you know, and Texas could say the same thing, you know, oh, if we didn't mess up, uh, you know, with turnovers and such and such, you know, we could have won this game and they're not lying, you know, but the thing is, is that OU defense caused a lot of the problems for them. For our, o- Oklahoma, there was a lot of self-inflicted wounds. I mean, technically Texas offense only scored 23 points in this game. You know, the score is 20, 34 to 23 if we don't do a horrible job of punting the ball in the end zone and we give up a touchdown, right? You know, that that's – those self-inflicted wounds is the things that get you – that you should have controlled. But at the same time, kudos to Texas. They caused the pressure they needed to to make it happen. But Dylan Gabriel out there, man, he's definitely in that Heisman conversation. We cannot deny him now, especially statistically, throwing for over 1,800 yards, 16 – you know, I think he has 20 total touchdowns. He's having a season. that, And, and because of that, can't overlook it. It's definitely something to keep your eyes on. Now, he's not – doing your Kyler Murray or Baker Mayfield type season. Yet, if if he ends the season over 4,000 passing yards and over – he's got to have over 40 touchdowns, he's definitely going to be going to New York. Well, yeah, and especially – I mean, because realistically, Oklahoma should end this season undefeated. Uh, there, especially after that game, there's no reason why they shouldn't. Uh, you know, looking at the rest of the schedule, it's not an easy schedule because you've got some teams that are they're upset teams. You got Kansas. Kansas is looking good this year. Oklahoma State's never going to be an easy one. Uh, even UCF, I'm I'm going to be at that game, and and they're they're just one of those teams. They're not they're not getting to a good start in the Big Twelve right now. They're 0 and 2 in the Big Twelve, I believe, and uh, so they're three, not getting, yeah. they're they're not having a good start to their to their Big Twelve debut, but. Looking at how, how how that team's been operating so far this season, that, man, that that Baylor game, uh, they just gave up, and then uh, on top of that, Baylor just they came out in the I think the fourth quarter and just killed them. Uh, you know, so just watching watching a lot of these schedule these teams on the on the schedule, Oklahoma should be favored and, and favored marginally uh, on most of these teams, but that doesn't mean that somebody's not going to sneak in there and just try to spoil your season. Uh, so Agreed. you know. Yeah, and, and and looking at this team, uh, Brent Venables even even mentioned that this team reminds him a lot of that ninety nine two thousand team, uh, and, and seeing how how tough they are, that's a good team to be compared to. Uh, there's even been others comparing him to to Bob Stoops' second year. That's a good year for Bob Stoops to be comparing to, uh, and it, you, it's. it's you got to pump the brakes a little bit. As a fan, we can dream. Uh, the team's not allowed to dream about that that far ahead yet, um, but. Right. I mean, looking at this performance against Texas, definitely a performance that brings up the discussion, is Oklahoma for real? And I think a lot of people are agreeing, Oklahoma's for real now. Uh, You know, Oklahoma surprised most people. Uh, They were a touchdown underdog in this game and came out and handled business. And like I said uh, on our show, Oklahoma won this game. I, I think there's way too many people saying Texas gave this game up. Texas made mistakes, but that was mistakes that Oklahoma forced. That interception by Gentry Williams ripped out of the receiver's hands. That interception down on the, the one-yard line, two-yard line down there, a, a huge aggressive hit popping it up in the in the air, and then the awareness to get your eyes up and catch the ball. So, uh, you know, and then, you know, looking outside of that, the, the fumble, just punching that ball down to the ground and just all kinds of things, all of this leading into Oklahoma being the force, being the one that's going to be more aggressive. So I think Oklahoma is for real. I think anybody who doesn't believe that is just out of their mind. Um, but looking at this, what do you think that this, this win – and this momentum that Oklahoma has right now, what do you think that means uh, for Oklahoma going forward? Right now, what it means is that they need to go ahead and not see any of the press clippings, do not watch television, stay away from social media, <laughs> focus on the opponent. But that's the good thing about having a coach like Brent Venables, right? That, that This is where I say this team is different. This is why I say having a guy like him and hiring him was the right choice. And honestly, an upgrade from what we had from Lincoln Riley is – He's going to put in their minds 100%. He's going to instill it. We are 0-0 zero and zero this week. We're going into the bye week with 0-0. Zero, zero. Next week will be 0-0. Zero, zero. The goal is to win one game. Focus on this one game. Execute on this one game. Do everything you're supposed to do in this one game. And then we'll leave the weekend 1-0. and oh. Then after that, you're 0-0 zero, zero, preparing for the next game. And so not overlooking your opponent because – I may mention about this in, in my show in a few places. So if you've watched me before, you've probably heard me say this ad nauseum, but that Iowa State game, there was so much rat poisoning taken that the team, like they, they, they messed up. I mean, yes, we won 50 to 30, a 30 point win covering the spread dramatically, right? But 
that pick six on the first possession was the worst thing that happened to Oklahoma in that game. And the reason is, is because they started feeling themselves. They, they, they walked in with the thought that, okay, Iowa State is bad. They had all the gambling situations going on. Hunter Deckard is gone from the team, basically. They've lost a bunch, lost, what, six starters. They're, they're basically tail spinning right now. But Iowa State's been fighting. They've been fighting from the gutter all season long. And so walking into this game, you get that interception and it's a pick six on the first possession. You start the game 7 0. You're like, oh, psh, this team is exactly as bad as they're advertised. We can sleepwalk and win this game. And what happened? Iowa State kept that game close 21 20 through most of the game. And then Oklahoma recognized on the defensive side. All right. Turn in, time to clock in. And the best part is I was actually talking to Michael Felder. He's over at Stadium as well as uh, he does uh, writing uh, on his newsletter called In the in the Felder. He played in the field, uh, in the bleachers, my apologies. And he also uh, played DB at North Carolina. And we were chatting about it, and he said, the one thing I recognize about this Oklahoma team compared to uh, the Clemson teams is that this team – looks like Brent Venables. And he what, he, why he what he meant by that is that it looks like the players are afraid they're going to get their jobs taken. Because that's one thing that Brent Venables is infamous of doing. If you don't look like you're giving effort, he's going to yank you. He'll pull you out, put somebody else in. And the big problem for that for a lot of players is if that backup comes in and takes that spot, a lot of the times they're not going to give it up. And that is what Venables banks on. Well, when you start seeing that, you start noticing these players say, hey, I'm going to do my urgency stuff. I'm going to come out for a breather, but I'm back in this game. You're not taking my spot. But they also come in each other. They make it to where it's a team effort and not just the individual. And so you start to see that urgency, to me, tells me that that's what makes this team different. And so they're going to take each game, one game at a time, until they can get to the end. Because put it to you like this, going from six wins to nine wins, pretty easy. Oklahoma had about five games last year that was a that was a possession or less, a point or less they could have won. Um, as far a score, a, yeah, a score or less, so it was like seven points or less. They could have turned those games around easily. Um, and this year, you can move those over. It just takes one defensive tackle, one complete pass, one more first down. You can win that those games. They're going to do that this year. But going from 9 to 10 is hard. 10 to 11 is really hard. And hitting that elusive 12, ooh, that's work. And so it's easy to move from 6 to 9. But going anything past that, going to double digits, it's a challenge mentally more so than anything. Yeah, and I think yeah. they'll be. Yeah, you said that very well, too. And and even on that note, too, uh, Danny Stutzman brought that up in the post game uh, there in, in the Red River rivalry and, and, and seeing what he said about that, because he said, you know, we, we got ahead of ourselves at, at Iowa State. Uh, Gentry made that that interception first drive of the game. We went over to the sidelines. We celebrated for a minute. We sat down and, I, and we said, all right, that was that was one drive. We got a lot of game ahead of us. And they did. You, you saw the difference there. And, and you see the mistakes being corrected uh, from week in, week out. I feel like you've seen that a lot, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, on, on the offensive side of the ball, you've seen it too, but I think you've seen it even more on the defense because, like you said, you're, you're seeing a lot more Brent Venables in that defense. Um, but lo looking ahead, I, like we said, we don't want the players to look ahead. You just focus on one game at a time. Us as fans, we like to dream a little bit. So let's let's go ahead because everyone's already talking about it. Everyone's pretty sure that this is going to be a rematch in, big, in, in the Big 12 title game. Uh, in December and seeing these two teams coming against each other. If you're Texas, you want Oklahoma to win out because you want that revenge game. And you also yeah. want the best team to be playing you in the big 12 uh, title game. So that way you can, you can show your resume a little more. So if you're, if you're Texas, that's what you want. If you're Oklahoma, you may not want Texas to be, make it there because it's tough to beat a, a, a team twice in one season. Uh, so yep. we, we've done it, but it's not easy. So, and you know, you look back, I think we beat Baylor, uh, you know, with that big comeback with Jalen Hurts and then come out to beat them in the Big 12 title game. Uh, and, 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 you know, so it, it's not easy. But if OU makes it all the way to the title game, if Texas were to meet up in that title game, uh, you bet, you, bet your, your butt that, that I'll definitely be, in my, my seat will be uh, reserved for me there in attendance if, if that's the case, because this is the last time for both of these teams and that's going to be a big game. But, if that's the case, if these two teams meet in the Big 12 title, 
Who do you got winning that game? I got Oklahoma winning it again. We left a lot of meat on the bone, just like Texas did. But I think the difference between us is, and I've said this, this is this is absolutely no shade whatsoever, because I do think that Quinn has one of the best, one of the one of the more talented arms in college football. Like he can hit on those out routes beautifully. The problem is, is he has a tendency of hesitation and he is turnover prone. If you know what you're doing, if you know how to throw them off, like for example, uh, this was the beauty of it, and this was a this was a very poor decision by Sarkeesian and that staff. They should have never let uh, Jonte um, Sanders. Uh, they should not Sanders play at all. Sanders mm-hmm. should not have played that game whatsoever because you could tell that for the most part he couldn't really plant. And so that first play they did, which was the exact same bubble screen they ran in 2021 when Xavier Worthy went 75 yards on the first play of the game and scored that touchdown, they did the same thing. We watched to do it. So he was ready. And when Sanders was running at him, he just threw him to the side because Sanders couldn't plan and actually blocked. But at the same time, this is where you would know in film study if you pay attention to the way Oklahoma plays. Any team that has run a bubble screen like that, we've gotten past the blocker every time and get a tackle in the backfield. That is probably one of our strongest defensive plays. Gentry Williams and Woody Washington are ridiculous in that right now. They are very good at that. And so I actually got a video. So depending on when you watch this, it's probably already launched or it's going to launch afterwards. Um, kind of talk nitpicking some of the things that Oklahoma needs to be better at going forward. There's a lot of things and components in this game that we missed out on like the underneath pass. We were giving up way too many underneath passes to Quinn as well as not keeping up with the tight end. That's something we got to get better at. If Sanders was fully healthy, Texas may have had a chance of actually keeping this good, but at the same time, we could have probably done a better job of eliminating mistakes. That hit by Billy Bowman you mentioned, they were former teammates in high school. And so, you know, Billy was excited about leveling his boy and he got that opportunity to take advantage. And so, what Oklahoma has to do is they got to focus on what's important, the task at hand, each game going forward. And if they do see Texas again, the bigger thing is is keep the pressure on, turn it up. Because we all know Venables loves turning up the heat. And I think that if you turn the heat up enough on Quinn, he has. we've seen him fold. We've seen him fold properly. Against Alabama, they did not get any pressure on him. And he got time to rest. He, he could chill. We got five sacks in this game. We kept them pressured. Every time they ran a play that we had an idea of getting, it threw things off. Queen couldn't do anything, and we ended up sacking them. And so that's what we've got to keep doing. If we keep doing that, we're golden. Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree with you. Uh, I've seen way too many people say that they, they still I, – I do have faith in Texas. I think they are a good team, and we dropped our, our top 10 power rankings. Uh, I, I have Texas still up in the top 10. I'm not dropping them out of the top 10. Uh, I'm, I'm going to drop them below – Quite a few of those those unra- or those undefeated teams, but that's just because you've you've got to do that for an undefeated team. You got to be ranked ahead, uh, in my opinion. But uh, you know, looking at Texas, I think they are a very good team. But like I said, I think Oklahoma. I, there's been too much of a narrative that Oklahoma, uh, you know, that that they. I, I guess that Texas lost this game more than Oklahoma won it, and I don't really agree with that uh, for the reasons that, that both of us have been mentioning. I think Oklahoma was more aggressive. I think Oklahoma wanted it more. They went out and played like they have nothing to lose, and that's that's what you, you saw from Oklahoma, and I think that's why OU ended up winning this game. I don't think Texas gave the game to them. I think it was taken from them. Uh, and, and you saw yeah. that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned a lot of things too with Quinn Ewers. You saw his eyes come down uh, constantly, just come down looking at the, at the blitz. And then his eyes pop up and he has nowhere to go. And he doesn't know what to do now because he's already getting drugged down to the ground. And do I let it go? No, because I might turn the ball over. And all of these thoughts are going through his head. A lot of that pressure got the Quinn Ewers. And, and that, did, that did slow him down. Not only that, but l- like I said, I think, I think Texas... They have some things they can improve, obviously. I think in every game, every team is going to have something they can improve. But I don't think Texas really had a bad game. Like I said, I think they had a very good game. Oklahoma yeah. had some things that really messed up this game. Uh, the special teams plays. Uh, the fourth down conversions. 
the, uh, the you know specifically in, in special teams you know with the, with the fourth down that it, you got to see there at the game we didn't get to see it on the TV because ESPN didn't want to cover that apparently they just let it fritz out on the TV um, but and then and then the, the blocked punt that turns into a touchdown that was that was an easy one because it just looked like they still had two guys wide out rather than bunching them up in the middle and making sure you block that because you you know they're going to come for the block um, but you know yep. Oklahoma had these mistakes that really should have been fixed or, you know, that not, not, maybe not should have been, but that really can get fixed and very definable moments in the game. And then of course the, the, the missed field goals also in the special team, two of them. So looking at Oklahoma, they had some key pieces to the game that could be fixed where I don't think Texas has key pieces that could have been fixed because like I said, the two passes, the two interceptions, that wasn't really Quinn Ewers throwing it to the defense. That was the defense out muscling the offense and getting to the ball. Uh, and, and I just I don't see that 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 kind of uh, progression that that Texas can have against Oklahoma. And I also think Oklahoma has been showing more of an improvement week to week where Texas came out strong. They, they started yep. off strong and they looked good all the way through up to this game. And I don't think they showed anything different. Oklahoma's looking different. I think Oklahoma's looking progressively better each week where Texas just doesn't really have to look better because they already look good. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm looking looking forward. Uh, like I said, I, I I definitely see this game, and I'm okay with with going against Texas. Uh, I'd, I'd prefer it maybe to be somebody else, so we don't have to go in that in that rematch because that is tough. But but I do see where Oklahoma comes ahead, and I totally agree with you, man. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what it is. Is you're seeing week over week improvement. The defense looks like a Brent Venables defense, and I mentioned this in a couple videos in the past that you can see the difference in the efficiency ratings i mean when venables got to clemson it took him a year they were in the 50s there the defense efficiency his first season his second season they moved top 10 and oklahoma last year they were in the 50s like 59 in, in overall efficiency and so not very good for what they wanted to do and they just kept falling apart late in games and this year they're in the top 10 and so it's looking exactly like it looked like in 2013 at Clemson, the way he was able to turn around. All he needed was to get his players and get them all the buy-in. And these players are bought in. They bought into it. They bought into the idea of being disciplined and winning because if there's anything that Grant Venables has shown is that his way will get you in the NFL. He's gotten three star players and two star players drafted in the first and second round at Clemson. You can go back and look at some of the old recruits. You'd be like, man, like Shaq Lawson was technically a three star recruit. And we know Shaq Lawson in the NFL. And so, you know, he's getting players like that. He's getting them to, to buy into what they're trying to do. And you can tell everybody's bought in. They're grinding for it. They want to be successful. And even their preparation for Texas, you know, Texas fans will tell you, Oklahoma, this was their Super Bowl. They were focused on, yes, this is just like Texas, the Super Bowl. Texas cares about beating Oklahoma. Beating Bama's awesome. You got to beat Oklahoma too, because that's a rivalry. And so they cared just as much and they're just as upset. And so they're going to have a bitter taste in their mouth and they're going to be prepared for the next time we meet. If it's in Arlington or if it's next season, they're going to be preparing themselves for that game because they understand that, Sure, everybody else in front of you, you got to be ready for, but that rivalry game is critical. Mm -hmm. That's something you're going to hear about for a whole year. You can ignore fans at Alabama. You can ignore fans for any other school. You can't ignore your rivals' fans because you see them all the time. And so because of that, Texas is going to be prepared. You know, Sarkeesian is always done a good job. He's a master and a whiz when it comes to uh, quarterbacks. And so he's done a really good job with Quinn. He's gotten him to calm down. He's looking even better. Hell, in this game, he had one incompletion after that second interception. He was 23 or 24. He had a really good game. They had a good game plan. They just yeah. couldn't finish against the way this defense was prepared for them. And that's all that matters is that in the clutch moments, Oklahoma won it. In the trenches, Oklahoma won it. And, you know, it's a tradition as old as the game itself. We've always done that. It's what we've done since 2000. Just go look at the numbers. It's how we've all. That's how we have a 16 to seven record against Texas. You know, in the last 23 years, it's because of winning in the trenches and you know, owning owning the game that way. So we'll see what Texas puts together. They got a, they got a tough schedule the rest of the way. They've got teams that want their head. They got a a commissioner that wants their throat. So we'll see if they can make it all the way through. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, Jay, man, I really appreciate you coming on, talking a little bit of Oklahoma with me. It's it's always fun. I, I hate hate dragging my guys through trying to talk with Oklahoma about Oklahoma all the time. So I appreciate you coming on and giving me the pleasure of talking a little bit of Sooner sports and Sooner football in particular. But uh, man, tell our audience real quick uh, where to find your stuff. Yeah, just you can find me unfair sports source for me on YouTube as well as wherever podcasts I download and listen to. Uh, love coming on, so I appreciate the time, Josh. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and for everyone watching, make sure to hit that sub- subscribe button and hit that like button as well. You can always find everything that we are doing on social media as well, so you can follow us over there. If you want to help us out and you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can give us a five-star review, a great way to help us there. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And until next time.